Welcome, welcome. My name is Lily Weinberg. I am a program director with our community and national initiatives team and thrilled to welcome all of you on a Friday to this conversation around building resilient city budgets and really linking this to the recovery in our cities. So before we start the program, I want to welcome Kelly Jen, our new um, or not so new um, vice president of our community and national initiatives. Um, Kelly is the former chief analytics officer for the city of New York and head of mayor's office of data analytics. Welcome Kelly, how are you? I'm doing well, Lily. Uh, I am uh, very, very excited to be here on a Friday afternoon uh, with all of you. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, just to kick things off here for the afternoon, um, I just wanted to open by saying having worked in government, budgets really are a uh, kind of ultimate expression of our priorities uh, within communities and, and across the work uh, that we do. And as many of you know, the community's portfolio we at the Knight Foundation invest in 26 different cities across the country, and we know that many of our communities, but also across the country, many cities, counties, states, and uh, at the federal level as well, are currently grappling with how do we spend a pretty significant influx of dollars, federal dollars that include the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, as well as more dollars that I think will be coming in the forthcoming months uh, and years. And so we really heard from all of our communities and uh, heard from our broader group of stakeholders across the country that this was incredibly important. Uh, we went ahead and funded uh, an investment uh, working in partnership with CityFi across five of our night cities. I'm going to list them very quickly, Detroit, Macon, Miami, Philadelphia, and St. Paul to really develop solutions around equitable budgeting and broader strategies to help support the recovery and rebuilding across uh, our communities uh, there, um, but also more broadly. So we're very excited today uh, that City Five will be joining us and will be colleagues across uh, the country that will be joining us to really talk more about these frameworks and also that City Five has developed a public playbook for leaders. Lily knows that I love a playbook, a good playbook, because other folks can pick those up and to be able to adopt and use those practices uh, across the board. So please, please, please uh, share the playbook widely, share this video recording and best practices widely. We will be linking directly to the report uh, in the chat and I see it now uh, popping up. So just again, a big thank you to all of you out there for joining us today. With that, I hope you enjoy the program and I will turn Turn things back over to you, Lily. Thank you so much, Kelly. And and that was really powerful. A, a budget is a reflection of our values. And our and President Biden also said something very similar. Um, you know, we're getting flushed with money, and and so it's it's, it's an incredible time. Um, so with that, um, thank you, Kelly. Um, I want to invite Gabe um, to the video. Um, and and Gabe Klein is a partner and co-founder of CityFi, a firm in the business of urban change management. Um, how's it going, Gabe? It's going pretty good, Lily. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing Great. well. Um, and, and really excited to talk to you. I think that I, I can't remember, Gabe, if it was like in last fall, but um, you had this, this, this great idea about working on um, budget resiliency um, in our cities across the country. And so quickly, I would love to hear a bit more from you about the why um, and the what, like what does this even mean, budget resiliency, and then just a, a, some of the key, you know, lessons learned that we had from working with these five cities in this sprint. Yeah. So, so you want to start with um, with the why? Yes, absolutely. And also, I just want to thank um, you and in, in particular uh, Kelly and the Knight Foundation for for supporting this because, you know, it was a gamble uh, and it turned out so well. And it was, I think, um, I mean, we'll hear from the cities later. It was enriching for us. Um, we learned a tremendous uh, amount as well. And so, you know, the, the impetus for this was to create like a workshop type in environment, a cohort, because we've all worked in cities. M many of us or most of us at City 5 have worked for mayors. And um, we just, we felt for them so much because 
we know how hard it's been since 2009 during the last crisis, right? And a lot of cities haven't recovered financially. They don't have the staffing that they need um, even now. And so they were sort of, in many cases, just recovering. It took many years and we got hit with this. So COVID-19 and the crisis was the main impetus for, for, for the five week sprint workshop. Um, and uh, you know we knew that cities were gonna face a big revenue loss. Um, we knew there was gonna be some influx of money, but at the time we didn't know how much it was going to be. And as the situation evolved, um, it, their situation has evolved and it turned from a five week sprint into almost like a eight or nine month workshop, which has been wonderful. Um, but it really begged the question of like, how can cities develop a budget practice? This is not gonna be the last hurdle that cities face, right? So how can they develop a practice that allows them to re respond and rebound from these types of issues more quickly proactively prepare for future budget challenges and do it in a way that really puts equity at the center. Um, you know, Joe Biden talks about uh, build back better. And I think build back better means a more resilient and equitable uh, framework. That's right. So, so, so I, I heard a couple of things. So, so when we're, when you're talking about the budget resiliency, I mean, you're, it's, it's about building like a framework and a practice. So it's like kind of a muscle. And then that allows um, cities to be able to handle um, crises in the future too. Um, and then really thinking about that, embedding the equity piece um, in there. So, so yeah. that's, Actually, Lily, let me just give sort of the definition that we came yeah. up with, which, which I should have in, in my answer. So the definition that, that we worked on with the cities and, mm -hmm. and came up with is budget resiliency is the practice of equitable planning, collection, mm -hmm. allocation, and distribution of revenue and programmatic spending to support long-term sustainability and equity in communities. So that's the definition that we came up with. And then the challenge is how do you, you know, really practically execute on that, of course. Mm, mm. So tell me, what are some of the, the key lessons learned that, that you saw over this, this supposedly five months, five weeks sprint, but, but yeah. it really has turned into eight or nine months. Yeah. Um, Which is seeing and learning. And, and it, it's turned it into, into something longer because I think the, the cities really valued it. Um, and we, so we wanted to keep a discussion going as the world's evolving and changing. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, I think it's about outcomes. And you hear this a lot, like everything's about outcomes, but there is a difference between outcome-based budgeting and just fiscal, you know, annual budgeting. And, um, you know, I think it's very easy for folks in the departments in cities and in the budget office, which by the way, touches almost every department in, in the city to get caught up in like, okay, what holes do we need to fill now? You know, what are the reactionary sort of problems that we need to address now? And it's not that that goes out the window, but when you have these once in a lifetime challenges and opportunities, um, you have to think more strategically. And so thinking about, you know, from the mayor, the council, the public, what are the outcomes that we are saying are like, these are our values, this is our vision, this is our mission. And how can we take this influx of cash? Um, and how can we do something really different? Or as, as, as Joe Biden says, how can we build back better? Um, so I think that was one of the big, big lessons. Um, and then like assessing who's at the table when making these budgetary de decisions and how equity is like intentionally instilled into a budget process. It needs to be baked in. It can't be something where it's like, hey, let's go through the process and then let's make sure that it helps everybody. You have to start with equity at the center and be cognizant and aware of it. It has to be very visible. Um, and then I think, you know, also considering where the funding comes from. For instance, if you're going to, you know, uh, do an experimental parking zone where you're gonna be charging by the minute in a particular neighborhood and it's gonna generate more money, is there a way that we can take that money and put it back into the neighborhood, into visible community assets, new park benches, whatever it is that the community thinks they need, or maybe, maybe it's, public safety, better lighting, right? But I think there's a better reaction from the community when they say, okay, we're gonna try something new, we're gonna charge differently, but we're gonna see the benefits of that right here, right? 
Um, and then last, I would just say when thinking about like equity and budgets and really when thinking about the budget period, think about return on investment. We often think like, hey, let's figure out how to spend this money. This stimulus money is coming. Let's spend it. Let's think about how to invest it in a way that benefits us for the long term, including the fully loaded social cost benefit, looking at environment, right? Looking at um, uh, well-being, health, equity. And, and so there's a difference between just spending the money and getting it out the door and sort of investing in projects that are shovel worthy, not just shovel ready. And looking at over 30 years, how does that benefit the community and all people uh, versus just a subset? Powerful. So, so it's really looking at the, the long-term impact and, yeah. and, and really making some calculations around the return on investment. Um, I also heard um, aligning outcomes, um, really asking yourself who's at the table um, and um, really considering where the funding is coming from. So, so these are great lessons learned. Um, without further ado, um, I want to um, thank you, Gabe, for, for, for talking us through that. And I want to invite our cities um, um, here um, and introduce Story, um, who will be moderating um, this conversation. Story Bellows is a partner at CityFi and Story. You had the pleasure to to be able to lead um, this work um, and know it really in and out. Um, so, so thanks for being here. And for the audience, um, please remember, um, keep your questions um, in your head and then you can put them in our Q&A box um, because we're gonna be moderating the Q&A and we're gonna be reserving time at the end to be able to elevate a few key questions. So Story, I'll hand it off to you. Great, thanks so much, Lily. And um, thanks to the Knight Foundation and to the CityFi team who, uh, as well as HRNA advisors who worked with us um, and our five amazing cities. Um, I can say that this has been such a privilege um, to work with these cities over the course of now, the last like eight or nine months. Um, and so I'm really excited to introduce um, three of the folks who we've been working with, um, Sadia Sitar, who's the Deputy Budget Director from the City of Philadelphia, um, Laura Logston, who's the Senior Budget Analyst in St. Paul, and Sharita Sims-Jones, who is the Grants, Grants Manager for Make and Bid. Um, thank you, ladies. Um, it is also really wonderful to be uh, moderating a panel with uh, three fabulous women who are leading um, budgeting practices and activities in their cities. Um, and I wanna start by um, asking each of you two questions, um, which the first is really what led you to a career in city budgeting, um, which is a, a field or budgeting and finance, often male dominated fields. And I think it's fascinating, um, although not the core topic of this conversation that we do have the three, um, the three of you here today. And then to really get us started, can you share a little bit of the roller coaster ride um, that your city has been through um, over the course of the last year and a half? Kind of where did you start? What have you been through and where are each of you um, now? So let's start um, Sadia with you, please. Sure, well, thank you so much, uh, Story, for having me on today. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sadia Sitar. I am the Deputy Budget Director of Analysis and Communications for the City of Philadelphia's Budget Office. Um, what led me to a career in public service was I was actually doing a master's in East Asian Studies at the University of Pittsburgh um, and realized very quickly that I was totally not suited to become an academic. Um, ended up taking a class in uh, public policy and the rest is history. I got a second master's in public affairs from IU's then School of Public Environmental Affairs and here I am today. Um, I have been with the City of Philadelphia's budget office since November of 2019. So just about three months prior to uh, COVID-19 making its appearance um, very, very boldly in our budget planning process for fiscal year 21, which we were doing at the time. And it was actually uh, literally, literally a few days after Mayor Kenny had proposed his fiscal year 21 budget that we were sent home, um, which we thought was for a very short two week stint, but ended up being into you know, the present. Um, some of our challenges are that we are the largest poor city in the United States. Um, despite the influx of a very healthy $1.4 billion in ARP funding, we are still looking at a big budget gap 
about a $1.5 billion budget gap for our five-year plan that we just uh, introduced this year. Um, we have a lot of needs, like a lot of other cities. We are also restricted by some pretty strict revenue regula regulations, a very archaic revenue structure in our city. And again, a population that um, the majority of which is under the poverty line. So very low revenues and very high needs is the lens that we look at, unfortunately, when we create our budget for the city of Philadelphia. Great, thanks so much, Sadia. Laura, if I could turn to you um, to tell us a little bit about yourself and St. Paul. Sure, and thanks, Story. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, this is a super interesting conversation. I'm glad to be part of it. Um, so I'm Laura Logston. I'm a senior budget analyst for the city of St. Paul, and um, I've been in this role just for two years. Um, so I, similarly to Sadia, started with the city, you know, just um, not very long before COVID began. So it's the majority of my time I've been working remote. Um, I was, I became interested in working for cities and with budgets um, kind of early in my career when I was working as an AmeriCorps member um, and just became really excited by um, how cities work with the nonprofit sector. And then I um, decided to go to grad school in public policy, um, ended up doing some work in program evaluation for a few years, but always kind of had my um, eye on local government and how to, um, you know, to, to get into local government because of the impact that it really has on, um, on communities and, and people's daily lives. Um, so really happy to have been able to join the city two years ago. Um, I would say the, the roller coaster for St. Paul um, has been probably, you know, like, like everyone else's experiences. Um, we were just sort of getting started on our 2021 fiscal year budget when COVID um, began. We had um, developed kind of a, a new process for developing the mayor's proposed budget um, prior to COVID. And then when COVID hit, it kind of threw all of our plans out the window and everything had to go virtual. And we were talking about um, significant spending cuts um, while we were facing so many needs. Um, the, the mayor, uh, Mayor Carter, set a goal for us that we would have um, zero city layoffs, 0% um, property tax increase, and zero usage of um, our reserves in responding to um, COVID. So those were some pretty intense restrictions as well through the budget process. Um, we had to look a lot at um, spending reductions, pretty severe spending reductions to achieve that, as well as um, really strategic use of the CARES funds that we received. Um, to kind of shore up some of the gaps that we were seeing in our revenues due to COVID. So, um, you know, it's really been a, a major challenge. And then kind of at the same time, then we were managing CARES funds that we did receive and getting those out, um, getting those funds out to the community um, in, in direct aid and, and support for our nonprofit community. So, um, so yeah, just um, like you said, definitely a roller coaster. And last but not least, Sharida. Hi, everyone. Um, my, of course, I have been with the county for over nine years now. I started in October 2012. And let me just say, I never thought government would be where I would end up. I've always been interested in business and finance since high school. So I was in your future business leaders of America um, clubs and just always thought, oh, one day I think I want to be able to do meetings <laughs> because it seems fun and seminars and conferences. So that kind of kept me on track with the business field. Um, I did get my associates in business administrations. I have a bachelor's in business and information technology. Um, also with a concentration in marketing. And then I have a, a master's degree in project management. So that really helps tie a lot of our budget and grants um, opportunities together for me. So it's been quite interesting uh, since I've started in October 2012. I learned a lot. I started out as a grants accountant which was quite interesting because, of course, governmental accounting is very different compared to everything else. <laughs> um, but it's fun. I, I must say it really gives you a keen eye on everything that's happening within your county and city. So that's really good to know. Um, and then as we continued on, I became a grants manager and the budget and grants manager as well. So I got to really learn a lot between writing the grants accounting for the grants on the back end, which I'm that person, it seems like I always see the back end of the picture, but somehow I get back to it where I start in the front end and now it makes sense as a whole. <laughs> so it's been pretty good overall. Now, as I've started, the roller coaster has always been, we had tax increases um, throughout the years. 
in the budget, especially. And then this particular year, we were, we got a new mayor. So we see a whole different perspective now as well. And he did a great job at coming in, creating a transition team to help us really um, change and, you know, focus on the community on various things that are needed in general and in bringing everybody together at the table. So it's been a huge change overall. We've had a lot of um, COVID hit. And of course, as everyone else would expect reductions in revenue, we were surprised that we did not have as many reductions as we thought we were going to have. Um, but the previous, the previous mayor did at least work with flexibility of scheduling for everyone. Um, and so that everyone is not on uh, at work at the same time with COVID and we were out for a few months. So that was also really, you know, interesting, especially when you just don't have a lot of the paperwork for certain things that you do in government. Cause let's be honest, a lot of us don't have just the automated systems to do a lot of things. So it's been really good overall. I've really enjoyed it. And it's been every year there is a different change, no matter what. I, you just cannot expect what may come each year, except to kind of just roll with it. So it's been great. Thanks. Um, and so as someone who has spent time in government, I know that you always pick up the phone when the budget office calls. Um, and so you have levers that you can pull across an entire city um, that many other departments do not necessarily have. And so as Lily mentioned, you know, we talk about a budget being a reflection of the city's values. Um, in addition to COVID being a huge issue, I think, you know, multiple of you have mentioned equity being a real um, critical issue for us to address in our cities over the course um, of the, the last year and a half and obviously going forward. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk, and probably Sadia, starting with you, um, a bit about how are you addressing equity issues in your budgeting processes? Absolutely. So I think moving into this year's budget, um, you know, I feel like for fiscal year 22, we made a conscientious effort to ensure that our budget not only supported um, the city's long-term fiscal health, but it also um, advanced equitable outcomes for all Philadelphians. And how it does it it was it did that was not only to, um, not only about you know how the budget process unfolded, but it was also about whom we brought forward in the process, who was at the table with us. So a couple of things that the city of Philadelphia did was that we released a, a survey um, about you know, asking folks about what they would like to prioritize in the upcoming budget um, for the city. Uh, and we were fortunate enough that we received about 13,000 plus responses to our survey. Um, and that helped identify you know, what uh, folks would like to see in our budget. A couple of other things that we did in the budget process to make it more equitable was that we have now started to create um, a, uh, abbreviated versions of our five-year plan. So we do a massive five-year plan, which is like an 800 page book, but then we also create a five-year plan in four pages and we translate it into seven languages. Something else that we've done to advance equity is that we actually um, initiated participatory budgeting in the city of Philadelphia um, in January of 2021. Um, this was a pilot program that we've started since then. Um, it is a um, million dollars in capital funding um, for projects around the city. And we were really fortunate that we convened a steering committee with the Citizens Planning Institute of the city, as well as the Department of Planning and Development. They are our partners in this. Um, and we've been working with the steering committee as well as our consultant to determine you know, how the people of Philadelphia would like to spend that million dollars. Uh, something else that we've done um, internally is that we have a, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion is working with city departments to identify racial equity plans. Um, we are looking at departments uh, performance measures to identify you know, which, what they're doing and what, the, what those outcomes of those work are that are impacting racial equity in the city. Um, and then we have identified internal goals with departments related to their, you know, um, MWDSCB participation rates. So those are the kind of things that we are doing on an internal and external basis to advance equity in the city. And Sadia, I know some of that information you've made public, is that like two other departments or is that outside of the city as well in terms of the racial equity um, goals and, and progress that you've made? 
So our racial equity goals, um, actually, um, all of our the infographics that I've mentioned, a five-year plan and four pages, they're all available in the city's financial, um, you know, finance website. If you go to our tab that says financial reports, you'll find all of the information there. Um, another thing that people will be able to see is that during the budget process, we actually started a new, um, you know, um, a new aspect of departments asking us for their asks or increases, or if they wanted to provide us with a cut to balance their budget, we actually ask them, um, hey, how is this going to advance equity or how is this going to do the opposite? So all of that information is present in department budget details uh, where they tell us how, you know, whether this would positively or like negatively, you know, impact equity in the city. Um, so all of that information can be found online. And thank you for reminding me of that. Awesome. I think, you know, releasing some of that and making sure that people are talking about it um, and have the opportunities to learn from what other departments and other cities are doing is something that I think we've certainly found um, as both a critical need and opportunity from doing this work is just bringing people together um, to have the opportunity to share um, some of the challenges as well as the best practices um, that we're all developing because obviously this is a, a changing landscape and we're all learning um, as we go and nobody has absolutely nailed it and you know come up with um, the, the perfect um, response to all of this. Um, Sharita, I'm wondering if I could turn to you um, to talk a little bit about um, how you are um, infusing equity in your budgeting processes in Make and Bib. Okay, so this, we're only in the month of June now, and I must say we, it's felt like a year already, <laughs> but the good thing is we had a new mayor start January 1, so we had to kind of get used to, you know, his tactics and what um, all he wanted incorporated and infused into the budget. And he started out with an actual transition team, which included various partners, um, community leaders, 31 different community leaders that helped engage our overall community as a whole. They had five different meetings where they held, they were held face-to-face -face, um, on, at on-the-table events and virtual. And I must say, we out of a population of 155,000 people, we had over 140,000 participate. So that was ecstatic. We were, that was very great and we were ecstatic. Um, we also had excellent community engagement, which left us with 20 goals to start out because again, this is only January 1, but <laughs> we're in June now. So 20 goals to start out and 58 action items to address based on the 2000 plus surveys that we received from everyone. Um, those surveys suggested that we address various situations such as blight, um, pandemic response, types of businesses needed in the area, um, public safety solutions, building upon our education systems, and creating more ways to engage the community itself in more inclusively and equitably. So it's been pretty good, I must say. Um, with that leadership team, it had people from, it's very diverse with the 31 transition um, uh, members from the 31 transition team. But I must say it had um, maybe somebody from the hospital, I think it is, um, our making Chamber of Commerce, some of our local community partners, uh, the five certain department, county departments, community foundation. And those are just a few to name, the department of education. So it's just, we were able to really touch a lot of, well, the entire picture within the community overall. Absolutely. Thanks, Sharita. And Laura, obviously the Twin Cities um, are, are a place where um, many of these equity issues that um, have dominated national discourse over the, the course of the last year have really been centered. And so I know you guys have been um, doing work not just in the last year, but before that, um, to make sure that equity is built in. And I think you have one of the more sophisticated approaches um, of cities you know, in the country in terms of how you're looking at infusing equity in your budgeting practices. So I would love for you to share a little bit about um, what you all um, have built in St. Paul. Sure, thanks. Um, so when uh, Mayor Carter um, took office in St. Paul, he established three key pillars um, for the city, which are um, equity, innovation, and resiliency. And those three pillars really are infused into um, all of the work that city departments are doing. Um, not that that, you know, those things were not involved in the work before, but they've really been um, centered in the, I think in this administration. Um, one of the ways that that has really come out in budgeting is um, a much more public facing budget engagement process. 
Um, prior to the pandemic, that happened in person. We called them budget games. Um, we would go out to um, community organizations, bars, breweries, um, schools, and the budget team would um, host this, you know, budget game, which was a paper process, and we would give um, participants, you know, a $10 million budget gap, and here are ways you can address it, and here are things that you might want to invest in, and it was this really interactive um, participatory process to get priorities from the community. And then um, our team would analyze that data at a really detailed level and provide a report back to the mayor that helped um, inform decision making about um, about the budget and kind of get that, that community input about, um, you know, what the community wants to see the city doing. Um, when the when COVID hit last year, all of that had to go virtual. And um, last year, that became a very um, you know, it was kind of a discussion process and it was, you know, still super valuable, but then this year that has really transitioned. Um, the finance team and our technology team have worked very closely together to create a really interactive tool that we can use virtually. Um, and we've been having these budget engagement roundtables um, with the community now. They just started last week and they're continuing for several more weeks. So our goal is to, um, you know, really engage the community again in that like deep level of participation around prioritizing, um, you know, kind of large areas of investment that are important to them and also getting them to understand like restrictions that we have. So you might need to cut some spending if you want to invest a lot more in one area or you might need to raise revenue and here's what that could look like. Um, so that's, you know, that's been a, a super important part of the budgeting process. Um, I would say um, similar to um, something else that was mentioned earlier was um, that, you know, a question about equity is included in the budget materials that departments submit as part of the budget process. So, you know, how is the work that you've been doing this year advancing the city's goals related to equity and how are any changes you're proposing, you know, going to impact equity in the city? Um, I would say also, I think maybe the last thing I would add is there are a lot of conversations happening um, in the budgeting process this year about the um, you know, pretty severe cuts that we, we took in 2021 um, that impacted a lot of our direct services to community. So um, we have way fewer library hours than we used to. You know, our 13, branch, our 13 branches, none of them are open seven days a week. Many of them are only open four days a week, four or five, and that has a huge impact um, all across our city. Um, you know, a lot of our parks and our, none of our pools were open last year. And so like, you know, those, those really direct services that um, everyone in our community needs, but often like community members with the most need um, are being impacted by the direct services that were cut. So we're really trying to figure out like, how do we bring that back? How do we restore services so that we're, you know, providing um, equitable service to, to our community? I'm wondering, um, particularly as we talk about community engagement and the idea of building trust, um, are there, have you changed or have you seen that departments are changing some of their proposals based on this community feedback? Um, how are you, what are the feedback loops so that you're actually going back to um, residents to um, engage them? And this is sort of open for all of you beyond just um, some of their inputs um, in the budget process, but are you thinking about, um, you know, how you go back to them to share with them what is happening um, on the on the back end of that? Well, I would say for us, yes, we are. Um, as we hold various events, we consistently get the community's information and input just to make sure we're addressing what we, what they feel like should be involved within it within their environment, their home area. Um, we have several things that we're working on as far as various events, and we make it a point to make sure we communicate through media, um, various you know local. Um, pages itself as far as like the uh, newspapers and so on. we just we try to make sure we cover everything to make sure the full community is engaged and we have certain systems where they can submit for um, certain complaints and other things that they may have that helps us you know kind of keep track of maybe what needs to be corrected or what needs to be fixed and as we continue to monitor those we of course continue to try to implement new and innovative ideas. Um, I know that um, some of you are infusing um, sort of the ARP 
um, funds into your existing budgeting practices, but I'm wondering what are some of the ideas that each of your cities are um, sort of forefront, putting at the forefront um, for how those, how those funds are going to be spent? And um, have there been um, any additional conversations if it's not part of your standard um, budget practice to engage your communities in um, how those funds may be spent in each of your cities? Um, Laura, could I start with you on that one? Sure, yeah, this is something that I'm working on basically on a daily basis at this point. Um, it's been the, the timing of when we received the ARP funds really lined up exactly with our 2022 budget process. So, um, which I think is both a good thing and a, and a challenge um, because from the, the budget perspective, um, it can feel like, okay, this is, you know, this is a huge source of funding. It's the same amount as our property tax levy, but like it's another source of funding. We can, you know, roll this into the budget process um, and maybe that'll be the easiest way forward. But, you know, as you kind of dig into it, like these funds have, you know, their first specific purpose. Um, there really is a lot of encouragement to engage the community on how these are going to be used. Um, and it's just such a, such a massive infusion of funding. It's, um, it's been, it's challenging to just kind of like layer it on top of the process that we already have. Um, so I think what we're working through now is understanding, um, you know, how do we be most strategic with these funds? How do we set up a plan, um, to receive proposals? How do we engage the community in that process? Um, so I think it is, um, it is possible that there will be decisions about using some of the ARP funds that'll be part of the actual budget, um, the, you know, the mayor's 2022 proposed budget and then the adopted budget. And then I think there will also be a separate process for um, soliciting proposals and on a, like a rolling basis over the next couple of years, figuring out how we're spending these funds. Um, the, the mayor has said publicly that he has sort of key um, strategic priorities for the ARP funds, um, and those are neighborhood safety, housing, jobs, mental health, vaccines, uh, modernization of city services, and then city financial stabilization. Um, so what we're looking at now is um, sort of creating working groups basically around each of those key priorities. Um, we'll be soliciting proposals. And then um, those working groups will be creating a, a plan for, you know, how can we use these funds and potentially other federal funds or other sources or, you know, partnering with our county or our school district um, in the area of neighborhood safety. Um, and in addition, you know, the, the White House announced just this week this um, effort to reduce gun violence and address public safety in America's cities. Um, and there's a collaborative of, I think, 15 jurisdictions that are going to be involved in that, and Minneapolis and St. Paul are involved in that. So I think there's just, um, there's a lot of attention to ARP funds being used to address neighborhood safety, which is one of Mayor Carter's key goals. So, um, so I feel like I've gone in a lot of different directions, but I think that kind of represents the myriad challenges that we face in trying to line up these funds with the budget process. Um, that can, you know, with, with a budget process that can be, um, you know, that's set up on a pattern that's set up to operate in a certain way that may not be as flexible as we need a process to be for something as huge as these federal funds. Right. Um, Sharita, how about you? So we have um, quite a bit of ideas that we are floating around. Um, we want to replace the loss of revenue, and I'm sorry, my light went out here, so it's, in mo there you go. <laughs> um, but it's replacing the loss of revenue through our hotel motel, um, general revenue, and our Lake Tobasovki area, which is a recreation center here where you can boat, fish, camp, um, picnic, and swim. Um, we are also doing government update upgrades like cybersecurity um, to the sheriff's buildings, EMA buildings, mobile units, public safety. Um, there is a program that the mayor just came out with and a, a bunch of community leaders in general um, to, as you said, to reduce um, violence within the area. So ours is called Making Violence Prevention. 
and it's MVP. Um, so we're going to look at funding that more as well. Um, then we have public facilities upgrades. So especially due to COVID, which was very unexpected for all of us and made us all think about things in a very different manner. For our public facilities upgrades, we're going to put touchless sinks. We're thinking about putting touchless sinks into our city auditorium and um, Coliseum. So those will be helpful. Tour tourism upgrades, creating grants to various tourism, um, tourism to the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and then blight removal, of course. Um, so, and that's another thing that it's a kind of two-part situation too, because as we continue to remove blight, um, basically we want to create affordable housing as well, affordable and transitional housing. So we feel like that would be helpful. So, and we can also maybe do loans or grants towards getting those affordable housings created. Um, educational services such as mentors, big brothers, big sisters, Boy Scouts of America, we were looking at that. And then of course uh, we have um, what we call a Brookdale Warming Center, which is a homeless center. Um, so that we have well, about 150 plus people in there right now, which our goal is overall again to maybe somehow transition those into that affordable housing and somehow access and maybe access the HUD vouchers over time. So we've got quite a bit of ideas going on um, that we're interested in and we're still engaging the community even more as we go because we all have, everybody wants something right now and wants to make sure that it, we move forward all together. Um, Sadia, last to you. Sure, so I think um, with the ARP funds, um, obviously, you know, in fiscal year 22, um, in fiscal year 21, um, we were looking at a, we closed a $700 million budget gap, and we were looking at a $450 million budget gap in fiscal year 22. Um, with ARP funds, of course, we were able to close that gap, but we, are also using ARP stimulus relief funding to fill the shortfalls in our spending. Um, and essentially we're using it to, you know, reopen um, the city. Um, we are also using it to keep people healthy in the city and keep people safe. Um, so some of the ways that we are using these funds is uh, to make up for lost revenues, just like Sharita mentioned in Macon, Georgia. Um, the Philadelphia, unfortunately, has a very, you know, archaic tax structure where the majority of our revenues do not come from property or tax revenues, but from wage tax revenues. And of course, with the majority of us working from home over the past 15 months, um, our revenues, wage tax revenues have been uh, deeply impacted by that. So the majority of ARP funding is being used to uh, recoup those lost revenues. Some of the other things that we're doing that we wouldn't have been able to do um, was we are opening, um, you know, our pools. Um, we are uh, expanding library hours, opening rec centers around the city. We are also able to um, increase paving um, on our city streets, um, you know, and then we are also able to create new programs in the city, such as um, COVID containment, uh, provide telelactation services. Um, we also had a lot of community grants um, that were expiring that we have been able to restore. And then of course, we also put some money forward budget forward for anti-violence um, efforts in the city. Um, and then we also were able to provide funding for 911 corresponder unit and other triage um, units as well. So we were able to do all of these things, avoid layoffs, um, significant layoffs, and of course asking departments for you know, upwards of 10% cuts um, had we not received um, ARP fundings for the city of Philadelphia. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna ask one more question before turning um, to the audience question. So please do um, add anything that you would like to ask um, our esteemed panelists in the Q&A. Um, and one of, the, one of a, the comments that I heard in our last um, cohort conversation, um, someone said that their predecessor um, had mentioned that it would be a whole lot easier to cut $10 million, then spend and reallocate a couple hundred million dollars. This is not something that we're actually set up for. And so I'm wondering, you know, this is a, this is a time of abundance, but that certainly doesn't make this an easy time um, for each of you um, and your de departments um, as you go forward to, um, to think about um, how you are actually ensuring an equitable budget. How are you at the same time um, using like creative funding sources like new revenue generation and thinking about cost savings and in-kind opportunities. But I'd like to ask the last question about something that we talked 
um, quite a bit about um, as we went along the cohort and Laura who didn't participate in all of that but is obviously running this as her day to day mentioned um, around how you're using partnerships um, to um, develop um, some of the outcomes that you're hoping to see and sort of deliver um, some of these funds and on the promise of, um, of using these funds for your city. So um, I'm wondering if you could share an example, each of you, um, of an interesting or creative innovative partnership um, that you all are using um, to um, solve some of the challenges that you're seeing in your cities. Um, and I'll open it up to any of you to go in um, first before I put one of you on the spot. Well, I can, I can Laura, go in. for it. <laughs> um, so in St. Paul, um, we are, we're the capital city. Um, the, um, you know, St. Paul received, I think the, after Minneapolis, you know, we received the second most um, ARP funds of, yeah, of any city in Minnesota. And then we received more than our county. Um, and then our school district actually received way more funding than we did. The St. Paul School District received the most funding in any school district in Minnesota. Um, so we've been looking at our county, between our county school district and um, the city, we have hundreds of millions of dollars and we have many common goals around some of those priorities I mentioned earlier, like housing, neighborhood safety um, and jobs. And so we've got some really good dialogue going with leaders in the counties and schools um, about like, how can we prioritize together? How can we share resources? Um, probably the best example that like happened basically immediately is the city and the county um, partner on a youth jobs program. Um, and it's a, it's a program that already is in existence um, for high school students and getting them internships in government, but also in local businesses. Um, and pretty much right away when all of us received our ARP funds, the county and the city started talking about doing like a huge expansion of that program this summer um, and expanding it to um, a little bit older of a, a cohort. So I think normally the program serves students that are like 14 to 17. And this summer they opened it up to, I think, 18 to 24, um, really trying to ensure that um, that age group of folks is able to get jobs, um, you know, this summer addressing unemployment rates, addressing a need um, also to create um, a better pipeline for employment into different types of careers, um, you know, into, and also just into city government and to county government. And so that was really the, the first program that the, um, the county and the, the city agreed to spend ARP funds on at all um, was like several million dollars of, of both of our funds to expand that program. And that is, um, I think is, is getting kicked off right now. So they didn't wanna lose this summer season. Um, so that was one example of, you know, both of these bureaucracies being able to come together like really quickly. Um, it helps that the program already existed. They weren't creating it from scratch. Um, but, but yeah, that's just one key partnership kind of in workforce development. And we see a lot of opportunity for, for further partnerships. Awesome. Um, Sharita? Okay, so <laughs> we have- And you, only one, only one. Only one, oh, I have to pick then. <laughs> okay, so the most recent one, I guess, that I will go with is, um, did you sure not two-story? No. All right, as long as they're really quick. <laughs> okay, um, the Making Violence Prevention Plan, that is something that we um, enacted around, I think it was June 10th or so. Um, and it is basically to gather a series of community meetings with the various leaders within the community, faith um, leaders, law enforcement agencies, other government departments, and just overall community leaders. And we're holding these meetings and also inviting the victims and families of victims to these particular meetings, basically, so that, you know, we can kind of get more insight about community engagement and how to spend that uh, more ARP funding on that as well and reducing violence within our area. And another one is um, the Knight Foundation. We're closely involved. They've helped us kickstart quite a bit and fund, uh, you know, help us um, fund some things. So we've got the mobile 211 pilot program, which is starting for us. Um, the Knight Foundation and um, United Way handle it, but we're looking at adding some funds there with ARP as well. And it just connects um, your Pe the people to uh, live in a community overall in what's already considered challenging. So it'll allow them to do like have access to food pantries, job search and placements and financial emergency 
um, assistance pretty much. So it's quite a bit going on. And then of course your um, C-Click Fix this, this, uh, system, the, sorry, I can't talk. C-Click Fix, that allows us to get a lot of the complaints from the department, from various um, community members, such as my trash wasn't picked up, picked up or, um, right away needs cutting or something like that, you know, with the Knight Foundation kind of helped us with that too. So we've got quite a bit that we do when it comes to partnerships between the local leader, community leaders, the um, law enforcement, government departments, and um, Knight Foundation, Community Foundation, Peyton Anderson. So yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, You're welcome. And Sadia, a quick one, because I definitely want to get to some of these audience questions. Um, so I think that Philadelphia is in a, we're in a bit of a different position. Um, we are, we do have, um, through our commerce department, the city does have a lot of partners that they work with to provide, you know, business relief. Um, and we have created like a, um, a restaurant, like revitalization fund, um, and to provide, you know, working with like different city and um, not other city partners. But I think our needs um, and the fact that we have such large revenue shortfalls um, is what the focus of um, these ARP dollars have been. And I apologize if I seem to have missed your question. Um, but, you know, we do have community partners that we partner with, with, with our Department of, um, you know, Office of Homeless Services, with our, uh, you know, um, Office of Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability, with, um, you know, our Commerce Department, Office of Children and Families. So those partnerships have been there and they'll continue to be there. But I think the level of engagement is obviously much different now than it was before because the need is so much more. Yep, absolutely. Um, I want to bring us back to process a little bit and talking about um, participatory budgeting. Um, and we have a question from the audience, sort of how does participatory budgeting encourage equitable outcomes? And are you seeing certain populations participating more through this process than others? Um, and so Sadia and Laura, I would love for you all to respond from uh, Sadia, your PB. Um, experience as well as Laura through the St. Paul budget game. So uh, uh, Philadelphia is currently in the beginning stages of its process. We did kick off our project in uh, our process in January, but we've had we kind of had to be on a little bit of a hiatus because of another very, very intense budget year. But how we ensured that we had as much as many folks from, you know, black and brown communities in Philadelphia engaged was that we partnered with the Citizen Planning Institute in the city, the Department of Planning and Development. Um, they were doing an outreach for, um, you know, the Reimagine Philadelphia Steering Committee, which is uh, working on the city's 10 year strategic plan. And, and through that, they, they were pretty um, you know, good about making sure that folks from you know, any and all types of communities in the city were represented. So those folks are fortunately on our steering committee. So we have tons of boards and commissions, folks from tons of boards and commissions in the city presented as well as a pretty good um, you know, cohort of um, city public from various um, neighborhoods and groups. Um, and like I said, we are in the beginning phases. Um, so we just wrapped up uh, creating a rule book for how the process will be you know, designed moving forward. And we are currently moving into our idea collection phase and later we'll be starting uh, community engagement and outreach for PB in Philadelphia. Great, and Laura, and maybe you also have the experience of doing it in person and virtually. And so I also wonder if you've seen a change or a shift um, in participants um, through those different modes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a super important question. Um, when we did them in person, I mean, I think both in person and virtually, to some extent, people are self-selecting to show up. And so um, that, can, that can create a particular bias of folks who are already tapped in, um, or um, if there is like a particular group that's organized very well. Um, I know there was a there was a budget meeting a couple of years ago where like a, a community bicycling group was like everybody needs to needs to show up for this budget meeting so we can talk about the need for bike lanes. And so bike lanes was like a major, you know, priority that came out of that meeting. That's fine, you know. Um, I think one of the things that we as a city are really working to do, the mayor's office has really takes a lead on um, scheduling these budget engagement sessions is also ensuring that we're partnering with community organizations. Um, so, you know, sometimes there'll be a budget engagement session that's with a, um, you know, a, a particular 
um, like, a, you know, among organization in St. Paul. So, um, you know, that while it's open to anybody, it's being sponsored by among organization. And so we're ensuring we're getting, um, you know, a large group of our Hmong population or, you know, a good representation of our Hmong population participating in those conversations. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of a mix of in trying to ensure that we're engaging community organizations that um, represent and, and serve different um, demographics within the city, um, but also, yeah, just being really conscious of um, who is select, self-selecting to show up and how is that potentially influencing um, the priorities that we're collecting. Um, and I'm wondering sort of to add a, a little bit more onto that is how are you creating transparency around the decisions that are being made in the budget? I get the input side of that, but then when you get to actually a point of decision, um, what does the engagement with citizens and sort of transparency look like um, at that point in the process? So I, I think for Philadelphia, we are currently in the process of our creating a budget. Like, um, you know, I see that it was put in the chat. We have created a budget video about our process, but we are currently formulating a budget video about key decisions um, that were, you know, made in the 22 uh, fiscal year 22 budget. We also, um, as far as transparency is concerned, we try to create um, documents in you know a variety of languages um, that are spoken around the city and make sure that they are, you know easily accessible to residents. Um, also um, that they are simple to understand. Um, you know, it's budget speak is easy for so many of us while it isn't for others. Um, and as far as the, you know, I, I heard you say input um, and we did do a lot of community engagement as far as the input of the budget was concerned where we reached out to various philanthropic business, um, you know, city, home city organizations um, to get their input on how to make this budget. But as far as actually, you know, making sure that our residents see that they were heard, um, our goal is, you know, just putting out on social media, the video, you know, do um, as participatory budgeting unfolds, do in-person events now that, you know, COVID-19 is receding and just to kind of make sure that residents know that they were heard in this process. Great, and last super quick lightning round question. Um, given everything that you all have been through in the last year and a half, um, I'm wondering what you see um, your city's doing to prepare um, for the next crisis. Um, what have you learned that, um, that will allow you to respond uh, more effectively um, once the next unexpected um, action comes in? Uh, Sharita. Um, so for us, definitely figure out how to increase revenues. Um, we are looking at implementing speeding cameras, which should kind of help us out. And then we're also looking, we've, um, we have funded a development of a solar farm that will be multi-county shared as well. Um, we've also had some, um, implemented some franchise fees to independent contractors for trash pickup. So mainly get the revenues there because <laughs> that's what it's going to take, especially once these ARP funds run out. Yeah, I think Sadia, Laura, Laura, go ahead. Oh, I'm Thanks. sorry. No, Sadia, you can no, go. Go ahead, Laura. You're, you're there. Okay. Um, so I think a, a major piece of the conversations that we're having around the budget this year and ARP funds is how do we make investments that will create like a more sustainable and stable financial situation for the city in the long term? So are there, are there major investments we can make that are that have like big one time upfront costs like modernizing certain city services that are going to have payoffs in the future? Um, are there things that we can do to restructure some of our um, you know, the, the, the way that we, we fund certain activities um, so that we can do it in a more sustainable way. Are there things that we can pay off now so that we can get them off the books in the future? Um, so those are all things that we're, we're really exploring um, with, because this is a multi-year but one-time source, we really wanna make sure that we're, we're trying not to rely on this to solve all of our budget problems that are ongoing and instead use it to create one-time solutions that'll help fix some of those structural problems in the future. And I'm gonna just second exactly everything that Laura said. This is a one-time solution. This isn't going to miraculously resolve all of our budget issues. Um, and also, um, you know, the city is also moving away um, from fees and fines, um, especially as they pertain to like public safety. 
um, so that uh, to increase equity in the city. Um, but I think one of the things that um, Laura said, I'm going to just um, echo back on is as a city, we want to focus on building up our fund balance so that we are resilient the next time this happens. Um, so that is definitely going to be our focus moving forward. One of our focuses moving forward. Thank you. And thank you all so much. Over to you, Lily, to close us out. Thank you so much for, for the time. We are right at, at 2 p.m. Eastern. So, so thanks so much for, for um, leading this, this conversation story. Um, Sharita, Lara, Seria, we um, learned a lot. Um, we heard a lot about equity um, and how do we build that into the budget. Um, and I thought that that was a perfect ending um, to end on, on how do we think about um, building resiliency for the next crisis too. All of this is in our, in the playbook that City if I pushed out, we linked to it again um, in the chat box. Um, you can find it on both Knight's website and both City Fi's website. So we really hope that you look at it and, um, and refer to it um, moving forward. You can see it in the chat. Um, so thank you so much. Story, do you want to do you want to say any final words? Um, no, just a huge thanks to Sadia, Sharita, and Laura for their time and their continued dedication um, to ensuring resilient budgets um, in each of their cities. I know that their residents are all lucky um, and better off for having each of them in their position. So thank you so much for doing what you do. They are. And we learned a lot and many cities are going to benefit from this. So thank you and have thank a you. wonderful Friday and great weekend. Take care and stay thank well. You. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye -bye. Appreciate Bye. it.